if you could talk about a little bit about what you think brought your family to Polk Patch. Um, my grandfather, Cornelius Harris, came from Tennessee to Polk Patch. And I, I have never heard the family say that they were freed slaves, but they had to be freed slaves or they couldn't have stayed out to Polk Patch. Uh, they would have traveled on to uh, freedom to Canada. And because this was uh, before the Civil War, and uh, so he married and raised his family out there. My grandmother, my mother's mother, uh, Talitha Lummox, uh, she married William Lummox and they settled out there. And he, I don't, he, he, what mom said, they done logging. He owned 81 acres of land out there. And it wasn't good farmland, but she said uh, they traded and they farmed and they, uh, with garden, small, small gardening and all. And she said they didn't have really too much money, uh, no reason to have that much money. It's what they would call barter trade. And uh, she said they would sell eggs. They had chickens and all, and they would sell eggs and, uh, and, and take them to the store and trade them for something else and all. And she said her, her daddy would come to uh, Arlington twice a year. And he had a trunk, a steel trunk, a uh, metal trunk, that he kept his money and his papers in. And, his, and then they were using gold. And she said he would get his gold out and come to town and pay his taxes twice a year. And uh, uh, so they, they st stayed out there at, in that area and raised their families and all. And uh, my mother had uh, one brother and there was four sisters. There was five, six of them all together. And uh, uh, she uh, said they, I, and, and the, the story goes, and there is a history of, of a, a, a young man, his name was Henry Hutchison, and he was a runaway slave. And he came to the Polk Patch area, and uh, uh, he cut cordwood for a living. And he w was in his shanty, sleeping one night, and the slave catchers came and, and, and caught him while he was sleeping and took him back to his uh, master or the owner in uh, uh, wherever he came from. I've forgotten where he came from. But uh, when, when the, um, before the war was over, he was set free and he brought his mom and dad and family back and to that area and he enlisted in the, in the Civil War. And when the war was over, he settled out in that area. And I think he actually moved to Corinth, which is not too far from uh, Polk Patch. And, that, and he married and had uh, 23 children. And one of his daughters married a, uh, a, a fellow from out to Polk Patch, and they lived out there. And they're buried out there in the Union Baptist uh, Cemetery. Um, There's hardly anything out of Polk Patch now. It's pretty, pretty, it's pretty barren. And, but the church, Union Baptist Church, there was a school out there and they called it Pine Hill School. And um, they had that school uh, for, it was at Polk Patch and it was mostly colored. And then they called it the colored school for a while. But then they uh, named it the Pine Hill School because some of the little uh, white kids would go and they were, um, uh, they didn't want it, I'm sure, to be called colored, so they named it the Pine Hill School. And they, it was out there for years, and I had a cousin that lived over there, and, and finally that school burnt. And when it was burnt, um, they were squabbling over the name, what it was going to be and what they were, they were going to call it and all, but the school was burnt. And they had to go to Gallia County or to Black Fork, and there was no more school over there. We had to know, the church was out there. It was founded in 1819. And uh, it's uh, really the, the oldest church in the Providence Association, but Macedonia, it was an old church. It was founded in 1813. 
and they always uh, argued who's the oldest. And, uh, and I think uh, but Macedonia is the old, was the oldest church, and it's still standing up there. It's a historical spot up at uh, uh, Burlington and Ohio. And, uh, but Black Fork is actually the oldest in the Providence, is what they say now, Eight, and it was 1819. The church was built the first church was the old log church it was built, and I've forgotten what year it was. I would say in the 1850s maybe, but the present church is up on the top of the hill, on Niner Hill, and it, is, it was built in 1819, uh, 19, 1919, 1919, and it's still standing, and that church has been enlarged, and it's, um, uh, the original church is there, but it has been, uh, oh, they have uh, air conditioning and um, uh, beautiful uh, bathrooms and uh, 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 lounge and even showers in there. And it, uh, it's open to the public and they have service there every day, and, uh, or every day, not every day, they have uh, Wednesday, uh, they have prayer meeting and the Bible study and choir practice and they, they do, uh, they have service every Sunday. And uh, we all go, they have what they call the union meeting uh, the third Sunday in October and uh, it's been going on for years and years. When I was a little girl they had uh, basket meetings out there and they would spread the sheets uh, and, and tablecloths on the, on the ground. And my, we'd just run from one place to the other eating all the food that we could hold. And uh, we had what was the old cookhouse then. They didn't, uh, and we didn't have electricity up there. And uh, they just, uh, they had oil stoves they would cook on and all. And uh, I think it was in 1938, I have a picture of them, the association being held out there. And you should see the old cars in these pictures, you know. But I remember them old Model A Fords and all, you know, with the rumble seats and all, rode in them many times. And you could see, it's just interesting to see the, the cars parked out there, and there's all these people out there, and, and my goodness, we used to have big times out there, but they still celebrate, and the people come from all around once a year in October, and I go out to it, and we all send money or support that church, but it's building up now, and for the first time, I must tell you that we have a white minister out there, and uh, at first, some of the people kind of objected. It's kind of hard to get a minister to travel that far at, out in the country and it, and it was a small membership and all, but that man is building up the membership and people are even beginning to move back to Black Fork. Uh, some of them uh, have uh, one or two families uh, up on Four Hill, what we call Four Hill. There's a new house they built up there and uh, they had the whole family, they uh, baptized and joined the church, you know, and some of the people's objection to thinking about this white minister coming in, um, and he's from Oak Hill, I believe, very nice fellow, and uh, I, I asked some of them, I said, well, what, is, what, what are they saying? Well, next thing you know, it's going to be an all-white church. I said, so be it. The church will be there. I said, if that's what it must be, well, if there's no black people to fill it, Go out and get them, bring them in. That's what the Bible says to do, so it's all right. And th they're just as happy with this man and the congregation is, is but uh, there's a lot of people coming from Portsmouth even, white people, and, and they support the church well. So th they, it, it's building back up again. I think they have what, from 50 to 60 almost every Sunday out there and it was down to like a, a dozen people maybe, you know. So I d just thrilled to death that they're doing that, you know. Because that's what it's going to come to eventually anyway because we're so mixed up and mingled up with uh, each other, you know. And that I, that's the only way that we can solve the segregation and the, the people can uh, uh, live, learn to live with one another. There'll be some to object, but that's all right. They always did. Now, you mentioned a lot of people in your family have a light complexion. Mm -hmm. Did anybody ever pass as white, or did most people stay within uh, the community of people of color? There was a few people that did pass as white. I know some of the family in here that passed as white. But the, the, the big thing about that, when you past is white, you had to leave your past behind you. You, le you left your family, 
you move to a, an area where nobody knew you, and po possibly uh, to another state, across the country even, and you never came back again. So you, you wanted your identity to be lost, and you cut ties with all your family and, and your friends. Uh, no, my family, uh, being the color that we are, I have an uncle that married a white lady. That was way back years ago, and uh, uh, we, uh, we loved her, and she was good to us. And they had, I think, five or six children, and, and I know they both are dead now. Uh, my uncle died about three years ago, and my aunt died uh, about a year ago. And uh, one of my cousins mentioned that they'll probably never come back around us again. And I said, I don't know about that. And so we had a reunion a, uh, a few weeks ago, and they were there. Two or three of them came. And I said, they don't want to leave us. They love us. <laughs> so those are cousins, you know. But they live in another, uh, up, up in the northern part of Ohio. And they, uh, th I said, they, are, they know who we are, and, and they want to be around us. And so uh, we get along fine. But there's a few of them out the Black Fork that went away, and they never came back again, you know. But my family lives down. My sister, all her children are married white. They all love us to death, and, and the families get along fine. We just don't pay any attention to it. We weren't brought up like that uh, in school. Uh, I think if the anything was any, I think the teachers more or less felt sorry for the black people. They knew the history and all, and and they were extremely good to us. You know, the 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 black children, and we didn't have any problems. On one side was a black family, and on the next side on, on, at our house was a white family, and we all played together, and we went to school together, and had little spats every once in a while, but didn't amount to anything. Just children things, you know, but that was it. Can you tell us a little bit about the story about um, the little kid Eubank? Oh, we had a little boy in school, and he, he was um, uh, a little white boy, and he had big blue eyes and snow white hair. It wasn't blonde, it was white. And he just, he, his neighbors were black, and they lived down there on the pike. And they uh, played together all the time, and he was with the kids in school, and they would call names. And they, every once in a while, they'd call these little, uh, black kids, uh, the N-word, and uh, these little kids went to the office to tell the principal, and well, this little white boy was with them, and he's the one, he was a spoke, spokesman for the group, and he said, they're calling us uh, the, the N-word, and we want them to stop calling us that. Well, he, what was wrong with him, he didn't realize he was black too. He, he thought he, he, I mean, he, he, he didn't realize that he was not black. He thought he was black too. He didn't, he didn't know the difference. So uh, the principal, of course, he talked with them, and he called them in, and he settled it, and that was the end of it. But we all laughed so hard about it because the little boy thought that he was black, and he, he didn't know the difference. <laughs> the children, children are taught if the parents would leave them alone, they, they, we wouldn't have all these problems, you know. But, and they don't want them marrying black, but I read an article a couple weeks ago in the paper, and they said by the year of 40, they will be, there will not be any white people. Pure, they will not be white people. They will be uh, 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 maybe brown or, then, but the white people are gone after, after the year 40. <laughs> That's the only thing. And they may as well get used to it because the generation coming on now, they don't pay any attention to that. As I said, my family down there in Virginia, well, they're just our family and that's all there is to it. And they love their children, they have children, and. They're beautiful children, and so we don't pay attention to them. And uh, my uh, sister, as I said, that's the one that is the, the blonde-headed, and, and her husband, his father was from one of the islands. I don't, I can't remember where it was from, but uh, we didn't pay any attention. He was a little tan, uh, uh, light complexed man, and he married a black lady, a light complexed lady here in the, in the United States. And so we don't pay any attention to them. We, it's just all mixed up, you know. And uh, my sister only had the one child, uh, Goldie, and uh, her husband is a minister, by the way, and, and they live in Toledo, Ohio. And my brother was a, a um, Bill. He was a, a, a career man in the service, and Bill uh, 
retired uh, master sergeant, and uh, he died in 1995. But uh, and there's uh, they his family's all down in Louisiana, and we get to see them. They come up and visit, and uh, we 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 are spread out, and it makes it kind of bad. But we do have the reunion, and they all try to come. And my sisters, we talk every night. Every, we have a three-way conversation every night. And one year, my sister had to oh, Hazel eat a tootle. She's over in Virginia, and she's the one that, she had to have a double knee replacement. And so we didn't get to see her for about three years because I was, had some health problems and couldn't go to her. And my sister in, in Toledo, her husband had fallen and broken his uh, artificial knee and had to have surgery. So we was out of, t uh, we didn't get to see each other, but we talked every night, and we still do. And so I've encouraged all the children in the family to, to talk to each other and, and stay connected because families, it's hard to, when they have children, it's hard to get them all together. But you can stay in touch and know who your family is. So we do that. Can you tell me a little bit about your parents? Um, who were your parents? Where were they born and their dates of birth? Did you remember? My, fa my father was born at uh, uh, Little Raccoon Creek is what we call it. Uh, it's down in the Harrisburg Rye Grand area. And um, uh, he was born in 1901, and he died in 1941. Uh, his name was Samuel Washington McDaniel. M my mother was born out of Bl uh, Black Fork at, uh, in the Polk Patch area, Waterloo out in that area. and. Uh, uh, she was born in 1898. She was a little bit older than Daddy. We used to tease her and tell her she robbed a cradle. And uh, uh, she, uh, they married and, and moved to Black Fork. And, that's, and my mother worked out at uh, the, um, uh, the uh, a hotel there in uh, Oak Hill and her sister. And they bought a car and had their license and drove and all. And mom was, um, I think, 28 or 29 when she got married. And uh, she uh, remembers when they allowed them to vote. And she said she was the first in line to vote when she was 21, you know. And uh, uh, she believed in everybody voting. She said, uh, you're not a good citizen if you don't. And uh, she encouraged us to take part in whatever activity was going on around you in community or what and she did and she she was just one of those progressive women she liked nice things and she did the best she could with what she had she worked at the charcoal plant out at the, after daddy died she never worked until after daddy died and uh, she got she went to the charcoal plant and were and cooked and uh, she uh, finally and in the summer she would take my Sister Tootle with her. My brother already was driving the truck. They they let him have his license after Daddy died, and he was only um, when he was 13 years old. But he he was actually 12 when Daddy died. And when he was 13, he was a big guy, and he could drive. And they brought him in here and got his license, and he drove a truck for this man hauling timber out there. And um, that's how we got some of our clothes to go back to school. He helped with the family, you know, and all. And uh, uh, Toodle, uh, my sister next to me, she went with mom to pick apples and sack apples at the uh, orchard out of Oak Hill. And I was the one that had to cook and keep the house, you know, and, and stay with my baby sister. And uh, finally, after we all graduated, my brother went into service uh, when I was a senior in high school. He was, he had enlisted and gone into the service. And uh, I remember the kids always got watches when you graduated from high school. And I didn't dare ask mom for a watch because I knew she couldn't afford it. So um, we got our mail at the company store. And I went over to get the mail one day and there was a package from Bill. And I couldn't wait to get home to, uh, to, for mom to open it. It was addressed to her. And she opened it up, and it was the most beautiful little pink-faced watch. Oh, I was thrilled to death that he had sent me, because he knew what everybody was expecting uh, 
everybody, all the girls and boys got watches. That was a standing thing out there. And I, he saw that I had a watch. I never will forget that. And I also remember from uh, one of the first presents that I, well, we, I, didn't, I never did ask for much of anything because I knew Mom couldn't, uh, uh, couldn't afford it. I remember all the kids got birthday presents and it didn't bother me. My birthday was in November the 30th and Mom always told me, she said, now your birthday is too close to Christmas and I can't afford to buy you a birthday present and Christmas too. So I understood and I never expected anything. On my 10th birthday, I, we all, all the girls had to make a cake, their own birthday cake. Now, I always got a cake and she'd have something extra like that, but to just get a present, I never got it and didn't expect it. Well, I had asked for a Betsy Wetsy doll, and I was in the sixth grade, and Daddy was living then, and we went to Grandma and Grandpa's for Christmas, and there was a big box in the back of the car, and I'm inquisitive. I began to feel around. No one it had to be toys in it, but I thought, well, what could, what could be in that box? And I began to feel, and I felt, and I felt this great big doll. It was a big doll. And I thought, oh no, there's no Santa Claus. Now I'm in the sixth grade and believing in Santa Claus. And so w that night we all went to bed. And next morning, all the kids, that daddy hollered upstairs and everybody came down for, uh, to see what Santa Claus had brought them. I didn't get up because I thought, oh, I, don't, I'm a fr I just was, I was so upset because I'm afraid that I'll see that doll and I know there's no Santa Claus. And so finally, Daddy hollered upstairs for me to come down. And I went down and there sat that big, beautiful doll baby. I was just sick, but I never let on. Do you know I was growing before I told them that I had already, <laughs> that's when I found out there wasn't Santa Claus. And then I had felt that doll baby in that box. I didn't tell it, but, uh, Things like that I remember, and I remember the games that we played out there, you know. You didn't have, we didn't have, tel what televisions, what, what, they were not invented. They didn't have televisions back in those days. And we had a radio, and it was a, I remember the shape of it, it was round, and, oh, and had these big batteries in it. Well, we only got to play it on Saturday night because we couldn't afford to keep the batteries, you know. And uh, so, uh, we would uh, listen to the music and all, and listen to Kingfish uh, uh, on the uh, uh, radio. And uh, but we made up our own games, and we would play. Uh, oh, Red Rover, Red, Red Rover. We get hold hands and divide up. All these kids. There might be twenty of us out there playing, you know. And uh, uh, we would see who could break the the string, you know. And uh, and. Uh, we had to carry water from the well. We, we, was, we were busy all the time. She saw that we were busy. And we had uh, chickens to feed and uh, hogs to, to feed and cows to milk. And uh, we just had, a, we had things to do. We had to get the coal and the kindling in. And we had to carry water from the community well. And mom had rain barrels at the end of the house. And uh, she would catch the water. And then that would give her extra water to wash clothes with. And the rest of it we had to carry from the well. Well, we were young and small, and she had a broom handle. And she notched it in the middle and set that bale, uh, uh, the, the bucket with the bale in the middle. And we would go to the wall, uh, well and, and fill that bucket with water. Well, there was a well that there was, at the well there was a bucket on a chain. And that bucket stayed there. So you drew, you drew the water up on, in that bucket and poured it into yours. And I remember us starting home with the uh, water one day. And my brother was real, real, he was, of course, older than me. And he just tilted that broom handle so all the water was over on my side. Well, I tilted it back to his side. And by the time we got home, we didn't have any water. And then we had to turn around and go back to, and fill up the water, the, the bucket again. We didn't tell Mom because she would have been after us. But we went back and we came back this time with a bucket of water. And we didn't try that again. But we. <laughs> And we would take water to the sand, what we called the sand pit. There was a sand hill, and we would go, to, and it was sandy on both sides. We'd go down in that uh, little uh, space, level space, and we would take sand, put a little water with it, put your bare foot in it, and that was our mold. And when we, if you get it just right, you could pull your foot out, and you could 
put little toys and doll babies and things in there. That was their house we would build <laughs> from sand. <laughs> um, we would play hide and seek and we would play mumbling peg. Did you ever hear that? That's where you take knives and flip them, you know. We had knives at our discretion. We, and you, you put three blades out there and then you would flip them, you know. And I could do that and shoot marbles. We would play marbles. We would ro take old tires and roll them, you know, and we would take uh, the steel ones from uh, your plows and things, and you could really row them with, and crook a wire from a coat hanger or something, or even just wire that was there at the house, real stiff wire, and that would be your stick to row it with, you know. And uh, I, I'm trying to think what else we did, but oh, we flew kites, and we'd be up there where my, and my uncle lived next door to us for a while, and he could, he, he could fly those kites and he had spatial things that he would roll them up on the, the string and you could, uh, couldn't hardly see them when they, they'd be up so high. And we just entertained ourselves like that. When we had any spare time, we had to study, we had to do our homework every night. We had to do our Sunday school lessons on Saturday evening, you know, and be ready for Sunday school because we, we finally, we, we loved to walk to church and it was four miles one way. And we would walk to church in the morning for Sunday school, and there would be about 100 of us in that church on Sunday morning. And uh, we would be ready with our questions and answers, but the answers, we, we knew them because we, they would teach us, you know. Daddy was a Sunday school teacher. Mom, and when my baby sister was born, I'm six years older than Goldie, and Goldie, by the way, she, she worked at Ohio State University Hospital, and she was a, a, a uh, oxygen therapist and she had her license and she was a supervisor and she finally transferred to Toledo's where she, she lives at. And uh, Toodle, she went to business school and she graduated from a business school and she always did secretarial work and all, you know. And uh, her husband was a spatial investigator for the House of Representatives there in Washington, D.C. That's what they were doing over in that area. And she has her son that is a I want to say Lieutenant Colonel. He's he's uh, he's in the reserves and he he's ranked and he's getting ready to retire, and uh, uh, he's working all his doctorates. And but uh, they're 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 just I just have a fine family. I have to brag just a little bit, but they're they're nice people. But we have a lot of fun together. Now, um, you mentioned um, your father died when you were young. How did he die and what effect did that have on the family? My daddy was a coal miner and again, here comes the mosquitoes again. It was cold and damp in that uh, mine and uh, uh, mosquitoes, it was in, there was a lot of mosquitoes around. We didn't know at a time what it was. We thought he'd had a sunstroke and it was in August when, it, uh, when he uh, uh, died. It was probably July when he had uh, was sick. He was in the garden working and all at once he had a, he got real sick and came in the house and he actually had a seizure. And uh, uh, they thought that he'd had a sunstroke and come to find out he actually had encephalomyelitis is what it was. And it was uh, inflammation of the brain and it was caused from a mosquito bite. And uh, uh, he also had black lung but you couldn't he was young enough that it didn't really affect him, with, but that's on the, the uh, death certificate, both of them. Encephalomyelitis and black lung is on there. So both your husband and your father Yes, isn't that strange? Because uh, my husband died of encephalomyelitis, Japanese type B is what it was. And this was just plain encephalitis, inflammation of the brain. But your husband didn't die got paralyzed. He was paralyzed, but on my husband, I, I said it wrong because my husband actually had encephalomyelitis, Japanese type B, which paralyzed him. He died of cancer of the sinus, upper and lower sinus in the eye. My husband was exposed to uh, uh, radiation from uh, uh, when they dropped that atomic bomb over there in Hiroshima after the war. And they went, he was one of the first troops that went in there after it was dropped. And 20 years later, he comes up with this cancer of the lungs, exposure to radiation. His brother was in Agent Orange. He was a career man. And David was over in, um, I don't know who it was, but, it, but they, he took all this Agent Orange, these chemicals off the plane. And 
about 20 years later, he died of cancer of the uh, stomach. He had an older brother that was exposed to radiation up in Alaska. He was a career man in the service. They both, all, all these men retired except my husband. Now, there was five of those boys and they were all in the service. And uh, the one that was in Alaska, uh, Curtis, he uh, died of cancer of the lungs. And uh, the type he had, there was no, nothing they could do to help him. But all those boys were exposed to these chemicals. My brother, almost 20 years from the time he was exposed, he was a, four, he was a, a um, fire chief in the service and they used a lot of chemicals. And I asked him, I said, Bill, did they not give you protection? Or, oh yes, they told us to, but he said they didn't stress it and we didn't take time to put that stuff on. He said, we just went on in there and did what we had to do and that was it. And almost 20 years later, he died of cancer of the, uh, he had multiple myeloma and that was cancer of the bone. Where all your bones are, it starts in your bones and it eats its way out. And so that's what uh, killed him. But. Uh, growing up, you said you were poor, but did, did, did that affect the family, or did you even realize that you were poor? No, we everybody was so poor, I suppose, we didn't pay any attention to it. And my mother was a, uh, and after Daddy died, it, it was, uh, 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 he died in, in 1941, and see, he didn't get to work under Social Security very long. I think Social Security, they started to uh, probably, uh, under Roosevelt, probably in 38 or something like that. So he didn't get to work under very long, so we had very little Social Security coming in, but that helped mom, you know. But uh, no, we were poor, and, and but everybody around us were, was they were poor, and they didn't know it either. And my mother was one of those people that canned and made apple butter, had her own meat, and and uh, uh, we had our own milk and churned, and, and uh, uh, made our own butter, and we didn't pay any attention to it because everybody was in the same boat out there. Uh, so, uh, and she didn't, she didn't, she didn't, she just said what she could do and what she couldn't do and that was, that was it. You, you think, she was very, she was a good manager. She knew how to, she knew how to stretch a, a dime and mom liked two meats on Sunday, you know, and she cooked three meals a day and you had to sit down and eat and that's all there was to it. And she was health conscious. And she was like that until the day she died. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by health? She uh, wanted green vegetables, and she wanted meat, and she wanted fruit, and she uh, didn't. And you didn't see fat people out there then. And the reason you didn't see them because we had to walk everywhere, and we, and we didn't get to sit. We didn't have games to sit in the house and sit there and look at the television. And so we was out. We were busy all the time. But she dressed you warm and she made you wear your boots and you, uh, she would always tell us, now if you get caught in the rain, don't run because you'll get hot and your pores will be open and you'll t catch a cold. You just walk and when you get home, we'll change your clothes. And uh, we didn't run in and out to the doctors because it, it, we was healthy because she, she watched us and she told us what to do. I remember the first time I went to the doctor. Now the old doctor out there at Oak Hill, uh, he and daddy were, good friends, they liked to fox hunt together. And uh, uh, I knew that he was coming down to see this man that was uh, terminal, ill. I didn't know at the time, I just knew he was awful sick. And uh, he was going to make a visit to his house. And I told mom I had sore throat. I said, oh, my throat is bothering me, it's so sore. And I said, I need to see the doctor. And she said, well, Dr. Allison will be down and to uh, this man's house and you get all cleaned up and you go down the seam and let him look at your throat. And I went and he knew who I was. And he said, uh, well, what's the matter? And I told him I had a sore throat and he looked in my throat. He said, well, I'll give you some pills today to clear that up. I mean, it's probably candy or something. I don't know what it was. But he gave me some pills. I was skipping home. I was so happy I'd been to the doctor. And I was pretty old, you know, I was big. I, I remember it very well. Now, you know, that's a shame that anybody, uh, those are two fibs that I know I told. <laughs> but uh, I had to see the doctor. Then we had a um, peddler that would come up on the hill and come through Black Fork, and he had all these different bottles of herbs and uh, 
different things that he sold. And mom bought some of that stuff and she used it. And I remember her <coughs> putting, um, uh, she would make something like a, a she called it a poise. And it was in a little red, she fixed this little red bag, you know, and put onions and stuff in it. And if we had a cold or anything, that got on your chest. And everybody's careful, they didn't want a cold because they didn't want that thing on there. But uh, uh, she uh, uh, would open up your chest and it was warm, you know, and all. And uh, she made that evidently. I remember it being red and evidently she made it from something, some leftover sweaters or something because it was wool. And uh, that's what she kept for that. And there was different other little things she would rub on your neck and around your, Vic Sav was always kept. And I can't remember the rest of the things she had, but it was just home remedies that she did. And nobody ever hardly had to go to the doctor unless you had an accident and had to be sewed up. Otherwise, you'd, you wasn't sick. There wasn't very, they, we didn't, we didn't, we, we were just healthy people. And I think that's one of the reasons we were healthy because she cooked healthy and she saw uh, that we had the proper clothing and all. And I remember when I was in school, every, the boys especially wanted to see who could go barefoot at first, you know, in the spring. And, boy, uh, one, and one day these, these two guys came down off the hill. Well, in fact, there was only one that actually came that day. It was too early in the spring, much too early. And he was barefooted, and everybody was all envious of him because he was barefooted and going to school. And uh, while he was sitting there, gray, a, a, a snowstorm came up. It was warm when he left, <laughs> but it, it was probably in March, and you know what we can do in March weather. And it snowed. And the more it snowed, well, they, they said he was putting his feet up under the seat so nobody could see him. And when school was out, they sung. There was a song where we traced the little footsteps in the snow. They traced him all the way home because he <laughs> ran barefooted all the way home. There was some funny things that went on, but that type of thing, it just kind of sticks in your mind, you know. Um, can you tell, you know, you mentioned the poultice. Was it always red? Was it was, and, and she just, I just remember the one red, red bag. Mm -hmm. I don't know that. It, it could have been any other color, I imagine, but by that being wool, it probably held the heat a little more because she'd warm up those, uh, cut up onions and put them in that little bag, you know, and then lay them on your chest. So it could probably could have been any, and if you stopped to think cotton, it would have seeped right through it right away, but that wool kind of held everything in, the moisture, I think. Um. I think we covered pretty much everything. Is there anything else that you would like to add to the interview or, or talk a little bit about what it was like to grow up during World War II, if you could a little bit? You, I can remember uh, out there, I remember in, uh, just before World War II, December the 7th, 1941. I remember uh, we were out playing in the yard and it was a place not too far from our house we would all gather. And we were just having a big time and going around in circles and just, just playing. And uh, uh, all of a sudden I stopped and looked up at the sky and the sky was light. It was just, it was pink bright light. And it was just like it was daylight. And our cows had got up and began to move around and the chickens were crowing and they were, Everybody was coming to life because it was daylight, we thought. And I ran to the house and told Mom, come and look at the sky. And Mom ran out and looked, and she just said, well, I don't know what that is. And we, everybody was looking up at the sky. And it was with, well, that was like on a Friday maybe or Saturday, and on, it was on a Sunday morning that Pearl Harbor was bombed. Well, everybody said, that's a sign, you know, that's a sign. Well, I've f since, and I halfway believe I've never seen anything like that before, and I haven't seen it since. Now, I've seen some skies where they say there's the northern lights and all, and that's what they tried to say years later, that that was the northern lights that we saw. I don't know what it was, but I do know it was uh, just before Pearl Harbor, I know that. And I know that everybody was so sad, and the, of course they instituted the draft, and they dra uh, he was 18 years old, I had a cousin, and you could hear, hear my mother's sister out there on the hill screaming. As they came off the hill, they had to walk down, catch the bus, come to Ironton, and 
uh, on their way to camp. And there was, um, they were about six or seven of them at one time that came off of Four Hill. And uh, my cousin was one of them. He, he was the youngest and he was 18 years old. And his mother just had a fit. And you know, during, uh, they, they took them to camp, they trained them, and they trained, and they, they trained them, they was, they called them, um, they loaded the ships and the planes. They had guns, but they had no bullets. They were segregated, that's true, they were seg segregated in the service. There was no, it was all black camps where they went to. And when it was time to be sent overseas, they took their bullets away from them. They didn't have any bullets even while, while they were training. They had the guns and all, but they didn't trust them. They were afraid of them. They, didn't, they thought they would turn on them because they know how black people had been treated. They know how they were be, being treated now. Um, they, when they came back and they had been over there, there was one, one uh, uh, I heard the story about this one that my brother-in-law was telling me about, and he said when they came back to um, uh, the United States, it said, now they called them all together and said, now remember, now you're coming back to the United States and want you all to remember where you are and act accordingly, which meant you don't go into no white places and all. Be, you just don't. You just don't do it. And but they weren't allowed to fight. They until I can't remember exactly before it was over. They did give them bullets because they got uh, desperate. And those men fought hard. And the Tuskegee uh, people and uh, made history, uh, guarding the planes when they went over. Then everybody would ask for them because they weren't losing any of those. They all they did was kept the fighter planes away from them. You know. Uh, the uh, ones that was carrying the bombs, and uh, they wanted those black men to guard them because they were really, really good at it. And uh, uh, they said they was never shot down, not in one of them, but um, uh, when they was guarding them. They, and so they was, uh, it's history. Uh, everybody knows about the Tuskegee Airmen, and everybody knows what they did to them down there when they did that uh, uh, test without asking them about uh, the syphilis, injected them with uh, syphilis to see how they would act and what kind of medicine could cure it. They've done, they've done a lot of things and they're afraid of what our reactions would be, but they don't realize, and here I go with present day history, <laughs> and I think about, uh, I just hope that we can have a black president, but. But if we can't, a lot of eyes have been opened and a lot of stories have been told and the man is very capable and, and I, it, it, it bothers me when I hear him telling these uh, stories about him that is not true and to the point that sometimes I'll turn off the, the news because I don't want to hear it. But I, I, I finally said a prayer and I said, if God intends for him to be a president, I don't care what they say and do, he's going to be the president. And if he is not going to be the president, so be it. But he is so intelligent, and we all should be so prou are proud of him. And so we'll just see what happens. But uh, uh, it, it, uh, I think it will come to pass. And if it doesn't, it just wasn't meant to be. But sometimes I get upset, and I turn the news off, because I don't want to hear him telling these stories about him. He tries to pick up everything. To, uh, he, he's just so smart. Um, I hope. I, I do hope he can get in, that's all. <laughs> he and his wife both, they, they, he, he stays on top of everything. Uh, he, he just does a beautiful job. Is there anything else you'd like to add, maybe about growing up or anything? I'll, I think I've told just about everything I can think of today. But I've enjoyed this so much, and I really appreciate you. I hope, I hope that it will be part of history. People need to be told about these things that happens to, has happened to us in the past. And um, like I, I go back uh, to Obama, I really think that, I know during the primary they, uh, it was told, you, you would hear him say, he can't take it when he gets hot and when they start insulting him all, he won't be able to take it. 
And I said, well, he can take it. He can take it better than they can because he'd been through so much. He was raised. He knows all about it. I said, we all can take it. I said, because we've had to be still and take low and all. I said, he knows exactly what's going on. I said, yes, he'll take it. He's stronger than most of them. So I, anyway, I, I thank you kindly. Yeah, thank you so much. I really enjoy talking to you. Yeah.